Hello, this is chapter 26 lecture from the patient care book and this begins on page 320 of your book and this is all about medical law. When we start off talking about this chapter, they start to reference that today's society is very um, litigious, meaning that everyone is so happy. They're looking to sue anybody for anything. So that brings into call the fact that healthcare professionals, including have to be aware of the areas of the law that can affect the delivery of healthcare services. Okay. When they talk about laws, they talk about the body of rules, regulations, and guidelines that govern the conduct in society in order to protect the health, the safety, and the welfare of its citizens. And sometimes medicine and law actually conflict with each other. The reason they conflict with each other is because each of them looks at the situation from a different perspective. One side is looking to see that the physical needs of the patient are being met through the diagnosis and treatment, and the other side is attempting to control the abuse of those patients, making sure that the patient's care is being met according to recognized standards of practice, and to make sure that if it is not met, that patients are compensated for those injuries um, that they receive at the hands of negligent healthcare practitioners. Right, so both sides are necessary to make sure that the patient gets the best possible care. And when we look at um, the different types of laws, we'll we'll go into this a little bit more in just a minute. But there is constitutional law, legislative legislative law, and case law. Easy for me to say, huh? All right, in 1914, um, there was a precedent-setting case. And this was defining the relationship between patients and healthcare practitioners. And it says that every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his or her own body. And a surgeon that performs an operation without the patient's consent commits an assault for which he or she is liable in damages. Okay, so that was a very precedent setting case um, in 1914 at um, the the New York Hospital, it was uh, Schloendorf versus the Society of New York Hospital. So that kind of set the precedent for all of us as healthcare practitioners. When we look at the doctrine of patient-provider relationship, recognize that it protects an individual's autonomy. Their autonomy is the right for them to decide what is or is not done to them, um, meaning patients have the right to decide if they want a procedure or if they don't want a procedure. Um, as long as they are of sound mind and they have the legal capability to make that decision, it solely falls on them and we cannot deny them. It protects the patient's status as a human being. It helps to avoid fraud and duress. Encourages healthcare practitioners to consider their decisions carefully. It fosters rational decision making by the patient, and it involves the public in medicine. All right. Again, all of this is the beginning of the chapter on page 321. We said we would discuss the three different types of law. Um, there is constitutional law, which is based on the Constitution of the United States. There is legislative law, which comes from administrative rules and regulations and ordinances. And then there is case law. And that one, um, that one pretty much is the one that affects us because case law comes from the common law of England. And that's decided on a case-by-case -case basis, either by a judge or a jury. And the decisions that are made in those cases determine the outcome for the parties, and they can be precedent-setting for future cases that have similar ca uh, fact patterns. Okay, So it's derived from the common law of England, and it determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And then the last one we have is um, contract law. Okay, when we talk about um, contract law, um, realistically, contract law is um, an agree where there's an agreement between two or more people or parties, which creates an obligation either to do something or not to do uh, something. So that is contract law. When we talk about the characteristics of law, laws reflect the values of a society. 
Um, laws exist so that the rights of an individual or a group cannot be encroached on or encroached by another individual or a group. And laws should remain dynamic, meaning changing, and it's appropriate to reflect the dynamic nature of societies. I know you guys can hear that bird in the background. Uh, she drives me nuts. She is a double yellow headed Amazon named Bodhi, and she might be what's for dinner tonight if she doesn't stop. So sorry about that. Some other characteristics of law is that laws have to be equal um, to all without discrimination. Law is based on what a reasonable and prudent person would do in a like or similar circumstance, and all individuals have basic rights and responsibilities. Okay? All right. A standard of care. Okay? Standards of care are um, what we have to abide by. The standard of care is um, basically it's a degree or a um, a degree of skill or proficiency, the knowledge and the care that is ordinarily possessed by a member in good standing within the medical profession. So the standards of care are what we have to abide by, meaning we agree to provide quality patient care, and there are certain standards that we have to meet. Um, they are ever changing as technology improves, and they're judged standards of care. You're judged against what a reasonable, prudent person would do under like or similar circumstances. All right, so your actions um, can be judged against what somebody else would do in that same or similar circumstance. So the component standard of care are outlined by the profession. So it is um, peer. Um, peer driven, I should say. All right, hang on one second. Let me try and get her quiet. All right, so the standards of care, those um, kind of go along with those practice standards that are in the appendix at the back of the book. When we talk about the American Society of Radiologic Technologists, those practice standards for medical imaging and radiation therapy are um, adopted by the American Society of Radiologic Technologists. They outline the performance standards of the medical imaging profession at a minimum, meaning you can always exceed the standard of care, but you can never fall below that standard of care. And it says that it's imperative that imaging professionals are competent in the knowledge and application of those standards. And like I said, that is found in Appendix A at the back of the book, which is on page 327. Now, some causes of legal action. Um, pretty much if you turn on the TV, you look on Facebook, you watch newspaper headlines, um, there are proclamations made about these huge awards that are given to individuals as a result of medical negligence. And a lot of times um, those stories are horrific. Uh, you read about patients that were injured um, by negligent physicians or nurses or uh, Biologic technologists, any healthcare professional, and even though those cases are disturbing, they tend to be the exception instead of the rule, meaning they're not the norm. Um, but it talks about the fact that those cases, even if they are the exception, the public will not tolerate actions um, by healthcare providers that are less than the generally accepted standard of care. And they, they reference that about 10% of all medical negligence claims are somehow related diagnostic imaging either by an improper diagnosis or injuries to the patient sustained during a diagnostic procedure. So again, recognize that we absolutely have um, the ability to be called in to testify about a case, to be recognized as a professional, um, to be recognized as an expert and testi testify about what was or was not done to a patient as far as um, being a 
reliable source for um, expert testimony. Some of these causes of legal action include torts. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll kind of define each of these, but um, a tort, assault, battery, false imprisonment, defamation, and fraud. Okay. So when we talk about these different causes of action, um, when we look at a tort, a tort is when a patient claims that they've been wronged or sustained some type of injury other than a breach of a contract for which they believe cause exists for an action for damages. Okay, so when they claim that they've been wronged or, or gotten some injury um, and they believe that there's reason for them to receive compensation for that, that is called a tort. All right. Um, as far as we are concerned, typically if a patient believes they've been injured during a procedure or while they were in the radiology department um, or they've received less than optimal care or they were threatened in some way, um, they, can, they can seek an attorney or seek counsel to bring um, litigation against them. It says that a lot of times the inquiries might not uh, lead to a lawsuit, but the complaints might be absolute legitimate concerns about negligent claims of um, the rest of these that we'll talk about, which are assault, battery, false imprisonment, defamation, or fraud. Assault. Assault is when a patient believes that they've been threatened in some way and they have a reasonable fear to expect immediate bodily harm. All right. So this is this is not something that um, it's really hard to prove assault if the patient is on the phone and you threaten them. But if they can expect that what you say you're going to do can be carried out relatively immediately, then they have a, a legitimate claim. If you're doing a procedure on a patient and they move and you tell them, if you don't hold still, I'm going to repeat this procedure. I'm going to. Um, if you are trying to insert an enema tip into a patient's rectum and you tell them, if you don't hold still, I'm going to shove this enema tip up and I'm not going to put any lubrication on it. Things like that. They're, I'm, I know I'm kind of being a little ridiculous, but I am not going to tell you that I haven't heard X threaten patients, especially when they get aggravated, annoyed with the situation. The patient might not be able to hear them or understand them. Um, the patient might be combative. Maybe they're in an altered mental state, uh, whether it's due to drugs or alcohol or the fact that they're just not um, able to cooperate like they should. Things like that can lead to um, text committing assault. Is it justified? Absolutely not. Assault does not require physical contact. It is simply the threat. Assault can only be or may only be verbal, but if the patient perceives that harm can come um, by those comments, assault can be present. Again, if you threaten to repeat a painful procedure on a patient, if you threaten to repeat the exam because they're not cooperating, um, anything that you do where you threaten to harm the patient or and they have reason to believe that can be carried out, that would be a legitimate claim of assault. Battery. Battery kind of goes a step further. This involves some kind of unlawful touching. Okay. Um, battery can occur, it says, even if there's no injury that comes from the unwarranted patient contact. So any unlawful touching can constitute battery if the patient thinks that the tech has touched him or her in an offensive way. All right. So when you're positioning patients and using palpation, which is gentle touching motion, we have to touch the patient to make sure we're in the right place. We're touching for uh, confirmation. We're touching for landmarks, bony landmarks, like um, the top of the crest of the pelvis. Maybe we're touching to feel where their spine is or um, where their scapula is, where their kneecap is, their patella. When you're positioning a patient, though, get their permission and use professional palpation techniques. I will tell you that we touch patients all day long, and there is absolutely nothing that should be misconstrued 
anything other than palpating to perform the exam. There's nothing sexual in nature. Um, there should be nothing sexual in nature. You want to be very mindful of the language that you're using with the patient when you're performing these procedures. Most patients recognize when they come for a radiology exam that they are going to be touched, but just to make absolutely sure, make sure you let your patient know, especially if they're being confused or they're not understanding you, maybe they speak a different language, maybe they're hard of hearing, just tell them, I'm going to have to touch you to find some bony landmarks. I'm going to have to touch you to make sure we're in the right position. I just want to let you know um, that that's what I'm going to be doing and make sure they agree to that. If a patient tells you to stop touching them, stop touching them. Um, sometimes they'll say that because they're in pain. If that was the case, I would try to use my words to position them. But if it's not possible, you can always seek someone else for help or guidance. Um, you could tell the patient that you're not able to, per to finish performing the exam at that time and they'll have to come back. It just depends on the situation. Any improper positioning method or rough handling can warrant a charge of battery. Where have I seen this? If I'm being honest, um, sometimes when patients come in, and they're inebriated or they're under the influence, maybe they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. I have seen healthcare professionals be uh, rougher than normal with the patients because they're annoyed. Or maybe um, you know that that patient in room two assaulted the patient in room one. That, that does not call for us to seek justice. We treat every patient the same regardless of who they are, what they've done. Um, but I have seen things like that take place. If you see something like that, I would, I would remove myself. I would not be caught up in that. Um, and I would go report it to someone that could stop that kind of behavior. But if you move a patient really rough or you're purposely um, rough with the patient because you don't like what they've done or maybe you just don't like the color of their hair, that is Absolutely justified cause for battery. False imprisonment. Um, false imprisonment comes when a person gets restrained or held against their will, um, if, even if they believe they're being held against their will. But if they are restrained, literally with restraints, or you put them in a room and lock the door, um, that is false imprisonment. The individual has to be aware of the confinement and have no reasonable means of escape. So if you put them in a room and shut the door, but the door is not locked, that is a reasonable means of escape. They can open the door and get out. So that would not be false imprisonment. But if I tell you that I'm putting you in a room and I'm locking the door and maybe you're paraplegic so you can't get up and check that, that could be considered false imprisonment. This comes about more with... Um, senile patients, pediatric patients, inebriated patients. Um, when those patients are inebriated or senile or pediatric, uh, it's a lot harder to get consent to restrain or immobilize them, but you have to get consent from someone that is authorized to give consent for that patient. So if it's a pediatric patient, it would be the parent. If it's um, someone who is senile or intoxicated, inebriated, then the, the permission has to come from somebody that is legally authorized to give that consent. All right. So you have to understand um, as far as false imprisonment, anytime <clears throat> there are orders um, for restraints, there has to be doctor's orders for restraints to be applied. You cannot restrain a patient and then go ask the doctor to order restraints. Okay, um, All of these situations, pediatric patients, if you look on page 161, there is a picture of what's called a pigostat. I'll let you flip there real quick um, and look at that. It looks like a torture device. Um, the Pediatric patients are placed in there to get chest x-rays typically. It does look like a torture device, but I promise you it is not. But if you were going to put a pediatric patient in there, you have to get permission from the parent before you place the child in that pigostat for positioning. So anytime you're going to do something that um, might cause a patient to be confused or not want to cooperate, make sure you're explaining it to the patient as well as 
to the person that is allowed to give consent um, for it to be done if it's not the patient. All right. Defamation. When we talk about defamation of character, um, this falls on page 322 and 323. Defamation can be in two forms. It can either be libel or slander. Um, slander is spoken defamation, meaning that um, you you say something about someone uh, in the presence. Like, let's say you are talking about a physician in the cafeteria. Hang on one second. I'm going to try and get her to be quiet again. I will be right back. Animal crackers are amazing things. Probably make her happier, so she'll talk more. All right, slander is spoken. So let's say you're in the cafeteria and you're speaking about a doctor and how competent he or she is, and a patient of that doctor overhears you and tells that doctor and is willing to um, sign a statement or swear under oath that that's what you said and it can be proven, that would be slander. Libel is written defamation. So um, they warn that with social media sites and the risk of disclosure of confidential patient information, you have to be very careful. Posting things on Facebook, posting pictures, saying things on Facebook or any social media, Instagram, Twitter, any of that, you can be held liable for defamation. So be very careful about what you post and what you say, where you say it, who you say it to. You just don't want to have to deal with any kind of um, lawsuits regarding defamation. And it doesn't have to be a physician or a coworker. It could be about a patient. Fraud, um, this is found on page 323. This is defined as a willful, intentional misrepresentation of facts that can cause harm to an individual or result in loss of an individual right or property. Um, fraud cases typically require three sources of proof. There has to be an untrue statement, which was known to be untrue by the person that made it, and the fact that it was done to mislead. The injured party has to prove that they relied on that statement and that damages were incurred as a result of relying on that statement. All right, um, they talk about, in the book, they give the example of modifying a patient's health record to receive compensation for a procedure that was not medically indicated. Um, that is absolutely, um, I have seen that, um, not seen it committed, but I have seen um, cases where facilities will document things that are not true um, and try to submit claims to get reimbursed for procedures that that were done but not warranted to be done so things like that you have to be very mindful of not be a party to um, don't get involved with anything like anyone that does things like that they talk about health information privacy we are going to talk about this uh, repeatedly because it is so important for you guys to understand that the privacy of uh, records and confidentiality are two clearly articulated um, subjects that we will discuss repeatedly. We have the Patient Care Bill of Rights that clearly defines that health records are to be held private and confidential. Health records are the property of the provider. Now the information in the health record does belong to the patient, but the health records belong to the provider. 
health information in those records, um, like I said, is property of the patient. But in this, in the technology age that we are in now with electronic imaging, it is critical that those images that are taken are kept accurate, secure, and confidential. We talked about in one of the other chapters the fact that health information management services, how um, records are kept behind locked doors, there's limited entry. Typically, it's a, your card swipe has to give you access to those facilities, and not everybody has access. Sometimes you have to um, seek special permission to actually gain access to that area. Um, and it's not something that just because you work at the hospital, you can get in there. So health records are a huge um, discussion of maintaining patient privacy. And that all leads to not only the Patient Care Bill of Rights, but to HIPAA, which stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Again, this came about in 1996. And HIPAA um, basically says that all patient health information is protected. You have to be mindful of any information that can be seen by other people. Uh, I'm sure you've all encountered when you go to sign in at the doctor's office or a dentist's office or um, any, any place where you're receiving some kind of medical treatment or dental treatment. Um, if you go into the ER, you're usually taken to a private area to register. If you sign in, typically you're signing on something that is removable, like a sticker, so they can peel that off. So the person behind you does not see your name or why you were there or the doctor that you're seeing. It has to do with what can be um, seen from the patient's room. Charts used to be placed on the door with the names facing out so that the doctors could go down the hall read the charts as they went down the hall so they knew where they were going, what room they were going. That is no longer the case. Um, names are not on the doors anymore. Charts are electronic. Um, even computer screens, there are certain screen um, items in place where unless you're sitting right in front of the screen, if you're off to the side at all, you won't be able to read the information. That's all done to protect patient uh, health records, patient information, to keep the privacy of the patient. And HIPAA is absolutely huge. You have an entire course that you have to take on it and pass. Um, every time you go on clinical sites, you will be retrained into HIPAA. Students fall under the same liability as technologists when it comes to maintaining patient um, privacy with regard to records, images, information, all of that. And, and like I've said before, any violation of HIPAA, typically it, it calls for immediate dismissal of the employee. So as a student, you can be dismissed from the program. As an employee, you can be fired, no questions asked. HIPAA violations are huge, are taken extremely seriously, and there are usually no second chances for HIPAA violations. Negligence, when they talk about negligence, it is failure to use such care as a reasonably prudent, comparable person would use under similar circumstances. The basis for comparison <clears throat> is premised on the standard of a reasonable, prudent person under a like circumstance. So again, you might be the model for how a technologist should act um, and then someone else's actions could be judged against yours to determine if they were negligent. When a patient is trying to prove a claim of negligence, there are actually four elements that must be proven. Um, in order to prove negligence, you, the patient has to prove that there was a duty to the patient by the healthcare provider. Um, basically, that's your standard of care. They have to prove that there was a breach of that duty by either doing something or thing to do something where they deviated from that standard. There has to be causation as a result um, of that breach, meaning there has to be some kind of compensable injury that resulted as a result of the breach of that standard of care. And then the damage has to be something that is a, 
uh, a monetary value can be assigned to. Okay, you've seen cases where um, surgeons have um, accidentally performed operations on the wrong body part, or maybe they've amputated the wrong body part. Um, I'm I'm quite sure everybody has seen things like that. Um, they do make headlines because they are so horrific when they happen. And typically people are quick to blame uh, the surgeon, which I'm not saying that, you know, the surgeon is not at fault, but I would argue that if ever been in an operating room, they are not the only ones at fault. Um, typically when a surgeon enters the OR, the only thing that they are able to visualize is the area of the body that they are going to perform surgery on, meaning everywhere else is covered up. So let's say they're supposed to amputate um, the right leg. When they walk in, the only thing they should see is an area where they can uh, perform that amputation is the only area that's uncovered. It's not like they're comparing both sides. They don't see the entire patient. Typically by the time they enter the room, um, anesthesia is in there because they've put the patient to sleep. The scrub tech or techs are in there getting out all the instruments, cleaning off, making the sterile field, uh, making the patients, um, the area where the surgery is going to take place sterile, um, having all the equipment out there. Maybe we're in there as a technologist with the C-arm, getting everything ready to take images. But when that surgeon walks in, they only see the exposed area. And typically that is how these cases would come about. Now, would the surgeon would suffer the brunt of um, the blame for that, but I'm I'm just arguing that there are many people that would be responsible for suffering um, the blame on that because they're not the only ones. It's not like they just randomly go in and grab the wrong leg and start to amputate. There is actually something brought about now um, to counteract that happening. And it's called, it can be called multiple things. In the OR, they can either call it a timeout or they'll call it a pause for the cause, meaning pause, hold on, pause for the cause, or they'll take a timeout. And it's where they actually, everyone involved in the case before the case starts. So once the surgeon's in the room, the scrub techs, anesthesiologists, um, x ray tech, whoever is in the room, respiratory could be in there. They will take a time out and double check the information prior to doing the procedure. They'll confirm the patient's name. They'll confirm um, what surgery is to be taking place. They'll typically confirm that they are on the correct side. Sometimes they'll even give the patient a Sharpie uh, before surgery, and they'll say, put a big X where we're not supposed to operate, um, and you know something like that, just to make absolutely sure that the correct procedure is performed on the correct patient in the correct area. So there are measures that are taken to kind of counteract those things from happening. So those four things have to be proven in order for a patient to win a claim of negligence. There are some other legal theories, um, legal doctrines. Sorry, this slide. I didn't realize <laughs> one's upside down, one's a little covered. I will fix that for you guys before I post this for you so that when you look at it, it will look correct. Just know that right now, um, when you're looking at the PowerPoint presentation, obviously you can see that it is not correct. So I will fix that for you guys. Um, when we look at other legal doctrines or legal theories, there are three. There is respondent superior, corporate liability, and res ipsa loquitur. All right, these are on um, page 325. Respondent superior, res ipsa loquitur, and corporate liability. So when we look at respondent superior, that translates literally to the master speaks for the servant. And what that means is in cases of medical negligence, um, Basically, the master speaks for the, the servant, pretty much says that if you do something negligent as a technologist, they are not going to only come after you as the technologist. They are going to probably come after you as the technologist, 
your boss, your boss's boss, the boss's boss, they're going to go all the way up the ladder to the highest level um, that they possibly can. Sometimes they'll refer to this as a deep pocket approach, meaning that they'll come after you uh, financially, but they might all the way up to the head of the hospital because they would look at it, the attorney would look at it as, well, you hired them, they, they were negligent, so therefore you are responsible as well. So respondent superior means the master speaks for the servant, meaning that not only is it likely that you could be brought into litigation, but it could go all the way up the corporate ladder to the top of the company. Res ipsa loquitur, um, that translates to the thing speaks for itself. And that one's kind of interesting because what happens is it switches the burden of proof from the plaintiff to the defendant. Because typically in a lawsuit, the plaintiff has to prove that the defendant was negative. Okay. But in res ipsa loquitur, what you pretty much have to do is it's assumed that you are negligent. You have to prove that you are not negligent. So res ipsa loquitur is when a patient gets injured through no fault of their own because they are in the complete care of another person. So let's go back to the OR. Let's say that um, you get done with a case. You're the, the technologist in the room. Anesthesia is in there. Surgeon is in there. Scrub techs are in there. Case is completed. And they're going to move the patient from the OR table over to the stretcher. The patient's still asleep, still under anesthesia. Everybody grabs to go and move the patient, but everybody forgot to lock the wheelchair. Or, I'm sorry, not the wheelchair, the stretcher. Everybody forgot to lock the stretcher, so you go to slide the patient over. As you do, the stretcher slides out, and you guys drop the patient on the floor. They break their hip. It is not on the patient or the patient's attorney to, re to prove that you um, you and everybody else in the room was negligent. It's assumed that you were negligent and the the um, burden of proof switches to now you guys have to prove that you were not negligent. Okay, so it's the burden of proof and it assumes that you are negligent and you have to prove that you were not. All right, and then corporate liability is probably one of the more confusing ones. Corporate liability basically says that the healthcare provider has to be responsible for the quality of care that's provided. Um, it says that malfunctioning radiology equipment that is knowingly used on a patient is a potential liability. So corporate liability requires that those healthcare providers are responsible for the quality of care given to patients. So not necessarily um, saying that they're responsible for the person, that provides the care, which they are, but corporate liability goes beyond that and it's talking about specifically the quality of care. So if you are using um, broken equipment, if your equipment is a radiation leak and everybody knows about it, but it costs too much to fix, so you're going to hold off for another month, but you keep using that room and a patient finds out or a patient's attorney finds out that there was multiple emails and memos put out about, um, oh yeah, we know there's a leak, we're going to fix it uh, next month, and it's still used, that would absolutely be a case for corporate liability. Okay, so those are three other legal theories that don't fall under the ones we talked about, um, but they are separate and unique legal doctrines that come into play. Informed consent. Informed consent um, when we talk about consent, there are two types. There's implied consent and informed consent. Now, there's not a slide, but implied consent happens. We talked about this uh, before. When a patient appears at the image department and allows you to perform a simple procedure, them showing up at the department either with the order or having made the appointment, that implies that they are consenting to the procedure, all right? And it is the most common form of consent in medical imaging. There is no signature required. You don't necessarily have to inform the patient of everything that you do with informed consent. 
um, but them showing up implies that they are agreeing to have that procedure done. The, on the other side, informed consent is based on trust. It's required for any interventional procedure, anything that is invasive. If something enters a body cavity, uh, if there's an injection, if there is a catheter placed, if there is anything that is done to the patient that is invasive, including surgery, that requires informed consent. What it does is assume the provider is acting in the best interest of the patient and in a manner consistent with the standards of care. It states that the patients have the right to make an informed decision regarding their care. And it's not typically required for simple, routine, non-invasive medical imaging studies. Okay? Typically, that falls under implied consent. The fact that patients have the right to make an informed decision, that is speaking about their autonomy. Okay? Um, as far as informed consent, it also is... Um, information provided in lay language, meaning you don't want to use real technical language when you're explaining to a patient the procedure that's going to be done. Um, it's provided in the patient's primary language is something else. You cannot get informed consent from a Spanish-speaking individual if all the forms, if their primary language is Spanish and all the forms are in English, that violates informed consent. Patient's autonomy must be respected, meaning they have the right to decide what is or is not done. The biggest thing with informed consent is that the consent form is signed and witnessed by a disinterested third party. Okay, So if, if you're consenting to surgery, it's probably going to be your signature and the surgery scheduler signature. It's not going to be your signature and the surgeon's signature because is he disinterested or she? No, they're the ones doing it, so they're very interested in making sure that that procedure um, takes place. Whereas the surgery scheduler, not that they're not interested, but it doesn't, it doesn't really affect them one way or another if the surgery is or is not done. So the biggest thing with informed consent is that there is a signature taking place. Remember, with informed consent, you have to explain the procedure to the patient, talk about any risks and benefits to the procedure, um, any possible um, outcomes if it is not done. There is a lot to informed consent. But, but don't overwhelm you and make you think that it's you know crazy technical. Like... Like, let's say that you come in and you have to have a procedure where I have to give you an injection for contrast. Um, all that means is that I would say to you, hi, you know, your doctor ordered this exam. How we do this is we take some pictures of you um, without anything in there so that we just see what everything looks like. But then at some point during the procedure, I am going to have to give you an injection in your arm through a needle will inject contrast into your arm and what that does is it allows us to be able to see that contrast on the radiograph. Um, it will go in through your bloodstream, it is colorless, it is clear, but what it does is go in and allows us to visualize that on the images, allows the radiologist to see that. So once the procedure is over, it's typically um, out of the system by urination. So when you go to the bathroom after this procedure, most of that contrast media will be filtered out. But I just need you to sign here if you agree to have this done um, with what your doctor ordered and we'll go ahead and get the procedure started. So nothing super technical in there. I'm not telling them that I'm giving them an injection of ISOVU 300 at a rate of so many milliliters per second. I'm not telling them all about the ionic characteristics and how it's bound together and how it'll go through their system and where the uptake will be. I mean, I'm not overwhelming them with all the technical jargon, just very simple. I have to give you an injection. This is going to go in. This is why we do it. And I need your signature. Okay. Implied consent. You show up to have a chest x-ray done. Your doctor ordered because you've been coughing for a week. It's implied that you're agreeing to it because you showed up uh, at the imaging department to have it done. Does it mean I don't tell you anything? No, I would still tell my patient that was having that chest x-ray, 
hi, your doctor ordered a chest x-ray on you today, so what we're going to do is bring you right in this changing room. We're going to have you take everything off from the waist up. We're going to put a gown on so that it's open to the back. And when you come out, I'm just going to get a few images of your chest for the radiologist to look at and give your doctor a report. Something super simple like that. You're still telling them what you're doing, but I don't need a signature because it's not an invasive procedure. And any facility, the facilities have the right to decide what requires informed consent and what doesn't all right so yes invasive procedures but if they decide that they want the patient to sign somewhere for every x-ray that is done they could absolutely um, implement that policy and it would have to be followed autonomy again um, the right to information and self-determination the patient has the right to decide what is or is not done um, it is it comes from informed consent it's their the patient's free will they in, uh, intentionally participate in the treatment and the respect and dignity are maintained if the patient um, regardless of what the patient decides you might not agree if a patient refuses to have something done but it's not really on you to make that decision you have to respect the fact that they are an adult that is allowed to make that decision for themselves, and we have to abide whatever by whatever their decision is. Okay? Doesn't mean that someone can't change their mind. Doesn't mean that um, that a physician won't try to encourage them to have something done. But <clears throat> we just cannot play a role in that as far as um, you know taking out on them that their decision. We don't agree with their decision. They reference that the patient's autonomy should always be considered when you're performing a diagnostic or a therapeutic procedure. As far as the informed consent form, um, the authorization clause is there to permit the physician or other healthcare professional to perform the exam. Typically, there is a disclosure clause to explain the procedures, the risks, the benefits, and the possible alternatives to the procedure. There also could be an anesthesia clause. If it's surgery, then there, there will be an anesthesia clause, meaning there has to be either initials or a signature for each of these. So you have to authorize the physician that's going to do the procedure, authorize that um, they've been told about the, uh, the procedure, the risks, the benefits, things like that. If there's anesthesia, they have to consent to anesthesia. They have, um, there's a no guarantee clause for therapeutic procedures, meaning if you're having therapy, typically it will say that um, ideally that will improve the function of XYZ, but there are no guarantees that it works for every single patient. There's a tissue disposal clause if the removal of tissue is necessary. Um, sometimes that'll, that'll say that how they dispose of the tissue, it might say that you will be charged a separate um bill from the lab for the tissue disposal things like that anytime especially with surgery the patient um understanding clause which states that all the information contained in the consent form has been carefully explained to the patient and the signature clause which calls for the signature of the patient as well as that of a witness typically the signatures at the bottom all of these other things tissue disposal the no guarantee clause, um, patient understanding clause, anesthesia, all of those typically are initials. And then at the bottom of the form is where the signature actually falls of the patient as well as a disinterested witness. Okay? Informed consent is very important along with implied consent is very important. In conclusion, as RTs, we are legally liable for our actions in the performing of these diagnostic procedures and patient management. And we have a responsibility to understand and practice the standard of care of the profession. There's no reason you should not um, follow those standards of care and act in the best interest of the patient. As professionals, we have to respect the patient's autonomy at all times that we have to keep their health information private and confidential 
and professionally appropriate behavior is premised on trust of the patient and a willingness to do no harm. And remember, do no harm is non-malfeasance and always to do good by the patient. That would be the hallmark of our profession is to always provide the highest quality patient care to meet or exceed the standards of care and to um, always respect the patient's autonomy, respect the patient as a person, as a human being, even if you don't agree with what they are deciding, we don't have the right to say that. All right, and that brings us to the end of chapter 26. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, please be sure to write those down and we will discuss the next time we meet. Thank you so much.